Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. You know what? You're a goddamn sword, little captain. Is there anything better in the world? Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show. We're live on Monday the 22nd of February. I was pointing out to a friend earlier on today that at 2.22 it was 22 to 22. 22. The 22nd of the 2nd at 2.22. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of how many twos that is. 26. Uh, nine, eight, nine. Nine, nine, no. Yeah, oh, oh, nines. Oh, we're getting the nines again. Just yeah, it, looking it at the lineup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm Stuart. I'm Andrew. We haven't done that for a while, have we? Yeah, no. I just thought <laughs> I would put that in just once in a while, just so just in case people new to listening to the show don't know who we are and wondering who who are uh, who are they actually listening to. Well, in fact, we are them. We well, should I'm also saying, we should also probably tell them as well how they can chat to us as well because we keep forgetting to do that as well. Well, there is a little. Uh, speech bubble in the bottom right hand corner you can speak to us there you can get us on twitter at uh, Monday Movie Show at Cryptic Tadpole at EHDVD facebook.com forward slash Monday Movie Show the website Monday Movie Show or you can email us Monday Movie Show at yahoo.com uh, before we go on to the lineup, one quick thing I want to ask you have you seen the posters out there for Sasha Baron Cohen's new film Grimsby uh, I haven't no although I have seen some clips and was trying to actually get a clip for it for the end of the show today um, and couldn't really find any that was suitable. I found one that almost was right up until the very end, and then it was kind of like, yeah, not going to be able to use that. Yeah, well, it, it, we're reviewing it on next week's show, and it's out on Wednesday in cinemas. Well, the poster. I has, could actually see it tomorrow night, but I'm not going to. The poster has two annoyances, in my opinion. The first thing is they've emphasised one part of Sasha Baron Cohen's character. That it really? just makes me question if if you can't get away with that kind of thing when it's a woman involved, when they enhance something to do with the woman, how comes it can get away with that, especially on a man and an area where you don't want to see something enhanced? The only thing I can think of is maybe that's actually a joke in the film. Yeah, but still, it's quite risky considering that it's plastered all over um, all over the sides of buses and on billboards and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So at every single bus stop in my town centre, you've got this poster. <laughs> and the other thing is, on the poster itself, you've got Sasha Baron Cohen, who's the lead actor in it. Mark Strong, he's uh, on the strap on the top. So one of the actors is in it, and Rebel Wilson as well. Also on the poster, picture-wise, so you've got Rebel Wilson and Sasha Baron Cohen, you've got Gabriella Sidibe. She's not even mentioned name-wise on the strip at the top. Hmm. And so why put Gabriella Sidibe uh, as a character on the poster itself, but not even mention her on the strip at the top? <laughs> It's just Who knows? weird. Who well, knows? We're looking at Grimsby next week on next week's show. So this week we're looking at these films in the cinema section. Yeah, we have um, a selection of um, things from all over the place this week's cinema releases. There's Triple uh, Nine, the um, police criminal thriller. We have a um, western crossover with horror, which is kind of interesting given that we've had uh, another period crossover with horror recently. But this one is uh, Bone Tomahawk. And we have the the finest hours, which is uh, sort of which relates to the clip at the beginning of the show, which is a uh, which from the perfect storm, because this is about another similar event that happened with a ship out at sea in disastrous circumstances. And also then we've got a, uh, a weird kind of ladies comedy, shall we say, uh, with um, how to be single comedy in big huge massive air courts. And in the DVD and Blu-ray section of the show. I finally get my full on see it because I'm the one who's doing the main review of the main film on Blu-ray and DVD this week, and which is Spectre. Alongside yeah. that, include. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so of course Spectre, which is the biggest Bond film there's been to date. Uh, we have then also uh, Nick Nolte and um, Robert Redford starring at Walk in the Woods. We have um, the Green Inferno, which is a um, uh, I forget his name now. Um, Eli, Eli Roth. Roth. Yes. Um, is it is it produced by or directed? Directed. Directed. 
And yeah. he, star he doesn't actually star in it, but he appears twice in it. Ooh, maybe we'll get a rant out of this from Stuart then. Um, we don't have the voice to do that. <laughs> we have um, Julianne Moore in uh, True Story Drama Three Held. Uh, we have, uh, I have no idea what it is, Nina Forever, so we'll just wait. Right, like no. um, and, and Charlize Theron in a surprisingly big, sort of well named cast in the small release of Dark Places. Yeah, a movie that got thrown out onto one screen when it was released in the cinema. Free held, as a matter of fact, we're reviewing it on Blu-ray and DVD, even though it's out in cinemas as well. Yeah. And on uh, video on demand, so on the Curzon on demand sites and places like that. It's actually been released in more cinemas than I expected it to be. I think so is it 12 it, screens or something like that? I think it's actually out slightly more than 12 oh, no. screens. Okay. But for a film that's getting released on both platforms at the same time, the last time... I think a film sort of like did that but was released on more screens than 50 was uh, A Field in England mm. and White Whiteley's movie but that was released on Channel 4 at the same time yeah the film for sorry at the same time so but this has got quite an impressive cast as well which we'll get to that when we're doing that yeah, later anyway and on top of that we have our TV movie of the week our overall movie of the week, of the week both top 10s Blue in DVD and the box office top 10 but we kick things off as we normally do with some movie news Yep, uh, we have a couple of details on upcoming releases and things that are happening with upcoming films we've got. Uh, first up is a piece of Justice League news. Um, obviously we've got Batman vs Superman coming out at the end of March, so we're just a month away from that. And then a month after that, on April 11th, only a few weeks really, um, is going to be begin filming of Justice League Part 1, which is again to be directed by Zack Snyder, who has now directed Batman vs Superman, and also directed the one before Man of Steel. Um, so he's basically got, well, what, he's doing all these, probably going out and doing interviews and stuff for it now, and then he's got to get sorted out and start filming the next one in three weeks or something after that which is crazy um, but they, they've set a release date for the film so he's got a target to get it done by which is November 17th 2017 so it's a year and a half it needs to be done and out which is a very tight schedule for a big effects thing yeah the Russo brothers have got the same kind of problem haven't they mm. so, so yeah it, it, it's it's the the fact that superhero films do big box office uh, they, they, they get some uh, fantastic money when it comes in from box office takings and so they obviously want to fast track any kind of film in the series or, or something like that so Zack Snyder is pretty much involved with every single film by the sounds of it under the DC canon and he's gonna I wouldn't be surprised if you see him as a co executive producer or producer on the other ones and so he's a busy person so he can't go here and pretty much do his own project because by the well, sounds of it he's gonna be tied up by uh, DC stuff. Well, the thing is, that this could be a good thing for DC having that happen because I was discussing this with people online the other day. We were discussing the whole thing about the fact of that there is Kevin Feige who's doing basically overseeing everything and seeing the connections and everything between all of the Marvel films um, because obviously you have things that are all in the same universe, so it has to make sense, it has to tie in and things like that. Um, and DC does not have that with any of the films and the only person really who's been in them and connected with them all so far apart from the actors has been Zack Snyder so it means that of course that as long as if he's directing them hopefully he will be kind of sticking to the same kind of thing with them and having them be you know similar they won't be doing massively radical different things from them and he'll probably get involved in some way as a producer I expect on all of them you know the the um, Wonder Woman film that we're going to get and um, any standalone Batman film that we'll supposedly be getting as well so I guess we'll see but it's I think it's a good thing I mean some people have issues with Zack Snyder I don't think he's a bad director um, I think he's actually good as long as he's he has the potential there he also has the potential like Michael Bay to do really really terrible films um, so it could go either way but I think it's good that at least there is one person who's going to be involved with them all to make sure there is going to be some sort of continuity there. Yeah, and the only problem is it's burnout. That, that, that's the only problem, and that's the reason why... Um, I forgot his name. Uh, I'm, I'm Josh Whedon. Probably, yeah, I'm probably going to be doing this all night, so it's, I'm going to have your <laughs> disease. But that, that's the, probably the reason why Josh Whedon has now stepped away from the Marvel Universe, because he got burnout with it. That's the reason why he had to do much ado about nothing mm -hmm. between both Avengers films, just so he could actually do a project of his own 
and um, just calm down, get away from the, the superhero bit for a little while before going back into it. By the sounds of it, Zack Snyder's not going to get that. And so he might like that idea, the fact that he's going to be doing in a genre that he knows that he knows, and he's very clearly safe in it. But that could lead to burnout. And so mm-hmm. he might not be able to do any project that he comes up with. He might come up with an idea and go, you know what, I, I fancy doing another horror film or doing something like this, but he won't have the time to be able to do it. Yeah. Or if he did have enough time to, or some time to do it, he might not be able to give it as much thought that he wanted to. So it could lead to burnout. And it, it can harm the films if that's the case. That's true also. Uh, next piece of news, uh, again, a uh, piece of information about releasing things. Uh, this time, Blade Runner 2 the sequel that we never really wanted or expect to get um, Dennis Villeneuve is going to be directing it uh, with Ryan Gosling starring as the main character whether or not it's going to be the same character that Harrison Ford played or a different character is not known um, but it's got a release date of January 12th 2018 what's interesting about this is that it's January which is a time which is not a usual sort of time of film for this kind of big film but it is 2018 which is one year before the first film is set in 2019 so we're catching up to the film we've already had things like the whole thing of Roy Batty you know his inception date was recently in uh, sometime in February and Pris was recently there you know the the one that was played by um, I've forgotten her name now was in Kill Bill as well I can't, I can't think um, yeah I can't think I, I will sort of suffer for this but um, it's you know it's all sort of catching up to that timeline now so and the thing is obviously we haven't reached the 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 levels of pollution yet that were sort of shown in that film and the, and the view of the future no flying cars so you know unless they do that in the next couple of years and it becomes widespread it's going to be one of those fictional futures isn't it probably yeah yeah um, it's under good, uh, good hands with Dennis Villeneuve. He um, said that um, when once Villeneuve was actually attached to the project, so it, it's in good hands with him. Yep. Um, finally, piece of casting news from me, um, which I'm really happy about, really, really glad about, um, and that is that Kurt Russell has officially been confirmed as being cast in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 by James Gunn. None other than James Gunn. It posted on Twitter on Wednesday official photography on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 has started and I couldn't be more stoked. My favourite movie as a small child was the strongest man in the world so I'm glad to announce that yes Kurt Russell has joined our cast and yes he is more awesome a dude than I ever could have imagined. Awesome. Good yeah. good, good casting again. Um, it is. I, mean, I, can't wait. I can't wait for Guardians of the Galaxy 2. It's probably it, out of all superhero movies it's one I'm sort of like more eager to see because I really did like Guardians of the Galaxy so I, I can't wait for it but y- you know what I'm like with superhero movies anyway mm. well, it's, and the thing is well, it's interesting with Kurt Russell because he is having this kind of this renaissance of coming back to big films and doing things now I mean because he, he was brought in with the Fast and Furious films he is in a film this week which you're reviewing um, yeah I didn't have any chance to see this yet and I actually want to see it but um, I mean I'm hearing good things so I mean it's he's definitely having yes, the everything yeah the question is as well because I mean there were talks at, at one point of whether or not it might have been David Bowie that was being cast in the film in a weird kind of twist so unfortunately his passing away may have been what's led sort of to Kurt Russell being cast in it but still great casting yeah very good casting and there was um, James Gunn posted a picture on Facebook the other day of him just being in a standard comic book shop in London just asking people for advice of what comics um, he should actually buy and it shows you what kind of comic book nerd he is so that when you've got um, somebody like Gunn he actually puts all his heart and soul into everything he creates Everything from the trauma movies, that's where he started from, all the way up to Slither, to Guardians of the Galaxy. You can see his fingerprints on on it, and Super as well. Super's a very underrated uh, film. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's just, I like, I love James Gunn a lot. I, I think he's a very intelligent person to get on board with these kind of films. The thing that's interesting about him doing that, about going into a shop and asking people what comics he should read, if he reads a Marvel comic and it's one that Marvel still has the license to there's no reason why he couldn't look at it and go oh I like that and having done Guardians of the Galaxy which done phenomenal business for Marvel and then Guardians of the Galaxy 2 will surely do good business as well he'll probably be able to go to them and say what about these ones what about this character 
is there a chance we can do this one? And he'd probably get it off the off the burner. Yeah, and he he was the one who championed um, Deadpool. He, he did, instantly, as soon as Deadpool came out, he did see he absolutely loved the movie. And just imagine if he he directed a Deadpool film. <laughs> Inc uh, incidentally, Ryan Reynolds. incidentally, did you see there was a Twitter post the other day that was very very good? A, a kind of the with between uh, Chris Evans, Ryan Reynolds, and um, uh, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm doing the names thing again now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. And it was no, the whole thing. No, it was it was a great thing. I have a look at it because it's basically it's it's, um, it's uh, Chris Evans basically saying, "Well done, Deadpool, amazing." You know, do that, and then Deadpool's like, "Thank you very much, great." And then and then then tags it, Team Cap, so yeah. Team Captain, and then and then of course Robert Downey Jr. says, "Really?" <laughs> kind of thing like this. Just wait till he he kicks you out for cussing. <laughs> so. Um, did you see the the quick interview between Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman? No, I, I thought that was actually quite funny as well because uh, Hugh Jackman was doing uh, a press junket, and so uh, Ryan Reynolds sort of like broke into the press junket and <laughs> interviewed him for a few minutes and just start ripping him apart about Wolverine and um, how Deadpool was in the Wolverine film and all that stuff. That that's also funny as well. I, I I'm gonna have to Hugh look Jackman that up. takes it in his stride. He, he's like that as well, and so you can just imagine interview both of them two. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be awesome. So hint, hint, Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman, if you are listening, please get in contact with us. There's <laughs> not a chance, but you never. Know. Yeah, no chance there. But <laughs> now I've got a ton of news, so I'll speedball through most of it. Uh, a couple of release dates. Uh, John Wick Two has been given a release date of February twentieth, twenty seventeen. I just recently picked up the first one actually, because I, 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 it's weird. It was a film that when I first saw it, I wasn't that impressed, and it has grown on me quite considerably. And I really do like it. And then I found out that it was made for something like the ridiculous amount of $29 million, which is a lot of money, but is not a lot of money for that kind of film and what you get on the screen. Yeah, and uh, Rings, which is sort of like the third in the Ring trilogy or the reboot of the Ring series or whatever you want to actually look at. So that it's released, it moved back. It was originally going to be released. And now this is not an April film, but it was originally going to be released on April 1st. Is it, is it the third one? It's sort of the third one, but not. So they're not doing like a ring cube thing or something like that annoying? No, it's, it's weird because there is a prequel to the original ring series, the Hideo Nakata ring series, uh, Ring Zero, which centers around the creation of a tape. In this case, it was an audio tape based on a player that was created. And so there is that one, which is a prequel to the Japanese ones. But by the sounds of it, this might be a prequel to the American ones. So sort of what they did with the quarantine series over it. It's a head scratcher. So now the release date for it is October the 28th. So they're releasing it around about Halloween. Okay. So um, other news, the Hollywood Reporter have confirmed that Dwayne Johnson is going to star in a sequel to San Andreas. Despite negative reviews, the film took $473 million at the worldwide <sighs> box office. Why? Why, 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 why? That's why. 473 million no I mean why did, why did it manage to take that much <laughs> a lot of people just saw a disaster movie with the rock in it and thought yeah why not it wasn't it even an especially fun. good disaster movie no it was terrible but evidently it was terrible that made nearly um, half a billion dollars so we obviously were going to get a sequel to it um, Emily Blunt is in talks to play Mary Poppins in the upcoming Disney sequel yeah I saw that I was kind of like what it's a bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Bumblebee is going to get his own spin off from the Transformers movies. He doesn't even talk. It's supposed to be a. Um, a th no, this is in huge, massive air quotes. It's supposed to be an indie film because the budget is supposed to be around about 60 million. So it's indie in the terms of uh, the Transformers series, considering that they're about 150 million, but the budget. It's supposed to be around about sixty million dollars. So what we're basically going to get is a car movie for about for about eighty percent of the film. Yeah, um, Ryan Reynolds has promised a one point five alternative edition of Deadpool. Hmm. Okay. Even they, they, they keep on flipping on this. They see yeah. There's going to be a harder cut version of it, and then there isn't. Now we see, and there is. We'll see, uh, I think. Yeah, we'll I see. think they're gonna they're gonna realize that they you know it's the kind of thing that, that you know. A stronger version of it on on DVD, yeah, people will buy that. Yeah, um, Sony is still developing a sequel to Zombieland. Still, well, the TV yes. series was terrible, so. 
it only got to one episode. Yeah, the pilot episode was absolutely atrocious. It was awful. Yeah, I watched that. That was head scratchingly bad. But yeah, yeah they're, they're still in development with the sequel to Zombieland. Um, Wolverine 3 could be rated R thanks to the success of the Deadpool movie. Mm-hmm. I have no problem with that. Yeah, I think they might. I mean, to make it up. I mean, the uh, thing is, well, the thing uh, is, there was the there was a slightly more graphic version which got a higher rating on the um, Blu-ray version of it, and it was a. Uh, I don't know because in America they don't rate them on any extras, but here you have to be rated, and here the disc was rated a 15. So because there's there is been more graphics, there's uh, a very bloody sequence, and there's some a bit more swearing in it as well. Not anything like Deadpool's, but more than you can get away with in a in a PG-13 or 12A. Exactly. Uh, Julianne Moore's in talks to play the bad guy in Kingsman 2. Hmm, okay. It's interesting casting, that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yep. As long as she's not like a villain like in, um, you know, uh, Seventh Son. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I, I scrapped that out of my brain, but thank you for actually putting it back in there. <laughs> oh... That was bad. Um, it looks like the famous Ghostbuster symbol will be the evil bad guy Roan in the upcoming film. Supposedly a, the toy line for the new upcoming Ghostbusters movie. Um, I think it's Mattel who's handling the toy line and any bets marked from following the nerd is screaming at me. No, it isn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the toy line was leaked and or some pictures was released of it. And it showed that Roan is the Ghostbuster sign. Okay. So that's supposedly being the main bad guy in the Ghostbusters all I can see this being hilariously unfunny. Yeah, it, the whole film is going to be hilariously unfunny. And um, final piece of news, not technically news, but I saw this and thought, why would somebody spend that much money? But a big fan of the film, Spectre, um, <laughs> has paid £2.5 million for James Bond's car. So the car that he drives in it, a fan of the movie, spent £2.5 million. <laughs> Mm, okay. It's ridiculous. Well, they're gonna make they're gonna make back some of the money, aren't they? I mean, not like they took a lot of the box office or anything. Yeah, and just <laughs> um, speaking about money, it's sort of like movie related, but video game related as well. There's a video game called Dying Light. It's a zombie survival parkour kind of adventure game, and there's um, a, a add-on pack released of it called The Following. Well, there is a limited edition, a special limited edition of the following. Now, there has been expensive limited editions in the past. There was a limited edition to Resident Evil 6. That was about £800. That came with a leather jacket. Then you got into really strange territory. There was a limited edition of um, of Saints Row, which came with a thing called a Wub Wub gun. And that was $20,000. And then there was a limited edition to Dead Island, which that clocked in at a million dollars. Well, this limited edition for De- uh, Dying Light is $10 million. What? There's only one made, and it pretty much offers you um, a starring role in the film itself, um, on-set stuff, you get stunt training and all that stuff. Oh, and four copies of the game as well. <laughs> okay. Just yeah. random. Yeah, I just thought I would throw that in there because I, I, I think that's ridiculous. $10 million. And guess who's got the exclusive rights to that limited edition? No idea. Game. <laughs> Game in the UK has got the rights to that limited edition, and there's only one. Somebody's going to spend that much money. Okay, the UK box office top 10, then at number 10 is Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Which I liked more than you did. Um, it is, I think, a very good meshing of these two weird genres that shouldn't work together and I think do very well and it has nice little touches in there that, that connects the two together and I think it's filled with a good performances well fleshed out characters and I, I really had fun with it and enjoyed it was that a joke well fleshed out characters you got that did you yeah, yeah. I, 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 just, I just didn't feel like it melded <laughs> both zombies and um, Pride and Prejudice t- together very well at all it was more like Pride and Prejudice plus zombies rather than the and and if you were insinuating there is an and with your film, you need to make sure that that and has some kind of prominence. Because when you watch Say- a movie and you see your film starts saying and, then you understand the kind of role that he's got. But in this case, Zombies is a part of the title. Saying that, though, the the title does actually have on it, the way it's done in the posters, is, is uh, Pride plus pre- Prejudice plus Zombies. And, but in that case, it still means and. <laughs> so, uh, yeah... 
And number nine is Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, which we really can't say anything more about, so we'll just move on. Yeah, number eight is Spotlight. <laughs> which I really liked. I'm surprised, actually. I've seen it um, having still having sell-out screens at the um, cinema I, I go to in Glasgow. And I can understand why, because it is a, a good drama. It's one of these... It's, it's a weird kind of drama that has almost thriller elements to it but it's not a thriller but it's it, it's very sort of tense scenes it, it's interesting it's the whole thing of the it's kind of like i said it's like the courtroom drama but it's the behind the scenes of the courtroom drama it's all the investigation leading up to it and none of the actual payoff which is what's interesting the payoff is literally in the end credits with it where it's explained what happened after these people found out all these things and after they then exposed all these things that were going on and it's an interesting way to actually tell a story but very nicely done okay, and before I go on to the rest of the chart just want to quickly mention some of the films that were reviewed last on last week's show which didn't make the top 10 included a bigger splash and number 11 took, yep. yeah number 11 then concussion which is one of Will Smith's biggest flops. It opened on 169 sites, taking only £111,000. Mm. Um, there was no uh, takings available or data available for The Green Inferno, but I do know that it only opened up on four screens. Um, <laughs> but the biggest flop was Gem and the Holograms. It opened up on 98 sites, only took £8,869, which gave a screen average of £92. <laughs> So that was a huge flop for that. So Not back good. Into the top, back into the top ten at number eight, the spotlight. Yeah, we should just done. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Did you? I, I wasn't paying much attention. I thought you were talking about Star Wars. So at number no. seven, that thirty grandpa. Yeah, which I really, it, it's just it's a, it literally is a <sighs> movie. It's just awful. It's terrible, and it's just Robert De Niro. And the thing is, it's not even Robert De Niro at his worst. It's Robert De Niro at good, but at, in in his worst film. And it's just a, it's atrocious. And number six is The Revenant, which you do need to see on a big screen. It's an amazing thing for that. If you don't see it on a big screen, you see it on a, something that's not that big. It, it won't have the punch that it does because it is a a visceral visual film. Um, I do think that Leonardo DiCaprio will win the Oscar this year. Uh, not because it's supposedly everyone going on it's his time and everything but because he has done a great performance in this film it has got some rough bits and some uh, issues with sort of the continuity throughout it in the middle in particular for me but it is a, a film with a great performance from him and a great visual performance from the camera work and, and the way it's shot and the way it's filmed yeah the, I think the only one of the reasons why no offence to the people around him but in under the best actor stuff Brian Cranston Matt Damon Michael Fassbender Eddie Redmayne now, two of them you could instantly just take out of that, so they're not strong contenders, which is Eddie Redmayne and Michael Fassbender. Even though, from what I've heard, he's done a, he did a really good job with uh, Steve Jobs, but the film itself didn't do very yeah. well at all. No, the issue yeah. with the issue with Steve Jobs, and if we're going into that for a minute, and Fassbender is Fassbender does give a great performance, but it doesn't really. It's because the film doesn't really seem to be really about Steve Jobs. It just seems to be a character of Steve Jobs, which is what I'm the problem is. Time, mm. but it, it just for if you look at the the surrounding actors around Leonardo DiCaprio by the looks of things, if you're just a passerby, you look at it and think, you know what, they just actually surrounded Leonardo DiCaprio with sort of like much weaker performances, so his stands out more. And no, cynics cynics would actually look at like that, and that's the reason why he's probably a shoe in for it. And I, I find it really annoying. If it is, if it does boil down to the fact that he's missed out multiple times and now is his time, if that's the reason why, then that's a horrible reason to win an award. No, I don't. I, 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 I don't agree with that thing. I mean, I mean, Brian Cranston in Trombo is absolutely superb, which will. Um, I don't know actually, it's not in the top ten, is it? It's no, no, it's a shame. As, um, but as an actor, I would not want to have won an award just because it was my time. No. I would want to have won an award because I deserved it for the role that I played in the film. And so if it does boil down to that, then that's a horrible way to win something as important. Well, considering the, the tarnished name that the Oscars have got, but <laughs> it's still an important award to actually win. Because when you say that you're an Oscar winner, it has a little bit of gravitas to you. Yeah. To you. And number five is Goosebumps. 
which is is the new you know Jumanji and Gremlins and that kind of thing mixed all together, and it's perfectly fine. It it takes the whole thing of the Goosebumps stories and makes them an actual element in the film rather than being about one of them. It's about all of them in a weird way, and it's very nicely, cleverly sort of mixed up. It, it, it is that kind of that family film. I mean, it's it's rated PG because it is a family film you can enjoy with everyone, and it's it's just all round fun. And number four is Dad's Army, which is a bit a bit disappointing because the humour in it doesn't really um, doesn't really hit where it wants to. It's very kind of hit and miss with its with its comedy. Um, a couple of gags in it do make laughs. Uh, depending on sort of some audience members seem to laugh, some audience members don't. It, it's um, I mean I I am not a fan of the series um, and I I didn't think it was terrible. I've seen a lot worse of these kind of like TV remade as films, especially when they they try and make them a big sort of ridiculous laugh out loud thing and a spoof in most cases. This doesn't try and do the spoof thing. It actually tries to be a, a sort of a proper serious version of the comedy but you know faithful I think to the show um, but I didn't love it I didn't hate it but it's I, I really wanted more from it and I didn't it didn't get the laughs from me that it wanted see one of the big problems is releasing it now what made them decide to release a dad's army film now it's sort of like them saying oh we're bringing back are you being served for one episode which is exactly what they're doing and it's it, it's sort of like doing what America's doing. They're looking back at all, some of the old films and looking to see what they could remake or, mm. or reboot. And that's exactly what's happening now. It's pretty much the same kind of thing when you get films based on TV series in, in, in the UK. The film always seems to come out at the end of the run of the, the TV series, but it's quite close to the end of the run of the TV series. Dad's Army finished about 25, 30 years ago. So the, the gap is humongous and it's a kind of thinking is it there just for the nostalgia feel from the people who originally watched Dad's Army or is it there to try and captivate a new kind of audience when you're not going to be able to do that considering that a new audience is going to look at it and think this is too fastidious this is too old for me so it was just released at a bit of a silly time a bit of a pointless time it's done pretty okay but if you put it alongside other films based on TV series then it's sort of like languishing behind like the this horrible horrible heinous movies that we've had getting like the mrs brown's boys or the in between the movies so mm, it's just a strange release for it yeah and number three is a new entry for zoolander 2 which is a real disappointment because uh, the first film is a great film as much as i didn't love it when it first came out i absolutely do love it now and the thing that's interesting about it is that it's all about the whole thing of models and it, and it basically referenced the whole thing of the model uh, industry and how weird and crazy and ridiculous it was and in the um, I think it's been 50, 12, 15 years, something like that since the original one um, now the whole thing of the, the, the industry has gone from insane to just ridiculous, stupid, crazy sort of thing, it's blown up even more and the the problem is they do a sequel, they think, oh we need a sequel, we need something for the character to do, let's give him a mission let's give him a thing he has to do instead of just bringing him back and having it be all about the whole thing of the fashion industry and that ridiculous, you know, just look at it and even the fact of showing how you know Zoolander is no longer the cool thing and everything because they, they even do that at one point in it for about five six minutes in a couple of sequences one in which involves a, a hysterically just weird but absolutely loving it performance from Benedict Cumberbatch doing the weirdest thing I've ever seen him do um, and that's that bit that made me laugh the rest of the film was just completely failure on laughs it, it didn't even get to the six laughs test it really just didn't yeah at number two was Alvin and the Chipmunks the Roid Chip this one is all over to you because I haven't seen it and I don't intend to Unfortunately, you will have to see it when it comes out on Blu-ray and DVD. Well, I didn't have to do it with the other ones, so... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, let's hope that that week there is very late and you definitely do have to do it. Have you seen any of the, the films in the series? Nope. I think I've reviewed every single one. Yep. Um, I don't think I reviewed the first one because I don't think we started the show when the first one came out. But I'm sure I reviewed the, the other two prior to this one because it's the fourth in the series and while you're banging your head off the wall <laughs> why are they keep on releasing these movies because they make it's money <laughs> yeah it, nearly five million is actually pretty impressive for it and it's not as heinous as you might think it is it is pretty damn terrible 
but it's not as bad as you might think it is. It sort of like goes hand in hand with Ride Along 2. When you when you watch Ride Along 2, and you're expecting it to be an absolute car crash of a movie. And it gets very close to that, but at least you don't feel dirty from watching it. And this is pretty much the same with Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Road Chip. It's not a good film at all, but at least you don't feel really bad for watching it because there are tiny little moments in it where you're thinking, actually, that, that's not a bad scene, or you get a tiny little smirk from it. So it, it, it is a pretty horrible film, but it's not that bad. And at number one, is a new entry for Deadpool. Yeah, which I absolutely love. I mean, as a Marvel comic book fan, I love as well. But the interesting thing that it is, is Marvel, while it's Marvel, it's not Marvel, it's 20th Century Fox, because it's part of the X-Men series. And it's ridiculous how much fun and stupid this film is. And yet, at the end of it, you come out having been fully entertained. It's got, it is literally a laugh a minute. There's so many laughs and so many gags that it's it's one of the funniest films that's ever been made because it's just brimming to uh, to the top of it. It's got some uh, a weird performance from Ryan Reynolds playing the main character who is just completely messed up, and it's just it shouldn't be this fun to be seeing a, a an action film that is this bordering on gross humour but get getting the tone completely right. Yeah, what, what I find interesting is the film um, opened up better than any of the Iron Man movies, including mm. Iron Man 3. It opened up better than any of the Spider-Man movies as well. However, if you take out the previews, <laughs> it's it done slightly less than that, but it still opened up better than any any of the Spider-Man, any of the five Spider-Man films. And um, obviously it opened up better than Guardians of the Galaxy as well, and this was a a movie that was predicted to do well, but not as well as it has, nearly 14 million pounds. It was it was predicted to do around about, sort of like Guardians of the Galaxy kind of money, around about seven million. And it's gone and shattered that, so well done to it. it. It was a risk that sort of paid off. And it's a risk that paid off, but it's sort of like looking to infect other sort of like movies in the Marvel Universe by them looking at going you know what we need to tweak the violence in this a bit more and mm. I'm really hoping that's not going to be the case with everything we can see the movies which might actually help if they tweak the violence and made it a bit more stronger so like a Wolverine film it would work with that but it can't work with every single Marvel film so I really hope that they don't get it into their mind that that's probably the best way to go around with them I, I think sort of like only stick it with what Fox has got I think that what they may have to consider doing, and if they do this, it, as long as they plan it properly and film it properly, it'll work fine. They should make the versions they're going to make as they're doing them now anyway, because they're, they're doing plenty in them for getting the 12A rating. But make them and have the option of the alternate sequences, the alternate versions, you know, the, the more violent scenes. And do, you know, what, what's what been done with discs now being released on, on the DVD version where they have the streaming thing and it has both versions on it and have the uncut version have a more violent version there for people because then people will be able to basically get the best of both worlds and also at the box office you, you're not risking losing money by alienating your under 15 audience yep. well then um, we better get on to new films of the week then so you're first up with triple nine yep uh, directed by john hillcoat it is a drama thriller um centering around a group of police um and criminals um some of which are sort of all working together as we're introduced at the beginning to a um a team that are uh, robbing a bank um one of them is a bit more greedy than the others steals some money out of the uh, safe that he's not meant to which happens to have one of these red dye packs um which sets off things in the car as they're going they make their escapes sort of all being covered and uh, sort of all get to their meet up point and you realize then that of these crew several of them are criminals but uh, a couple of them are actually uh, bent police dirty dirty coppers um the whole thing is then that they're all sort of in this situation they've done this job for someone uh, related to the the russian mob um played by kate winslet the leader of the group, played by Juatel Ejiofor, um, is sort of in her pocket for a reason that's kind of um, set up later on. But it's basically he's beholden to her, having to do the jobs for her, and she comes to him basically saying that there's another one which they need to do. And the problem is this is going to be in a place where they'll get caught, they'll get killed. You know, problems, things aren't going to go well. So of course they have a look around and sort of discussion between themselves, thinking, you know, if we don't do this, we're in trouble. What else can we do? Here's a clip. 
Zarina. What's she after? She ain't said yet. Whatever it is, it's in an unmarked homeland security building. How many guards? Unknown. Unknown, probably a lot. So what are we talking? Four, maybe five minutes tops? Oh, man. We're looking at ten. Response, be honest, in three minutes. Well, they'll kill every last one of us we don't get this thing. We could pull a 999. Now, what a 999 is, is the thing of that any time that a police officer is shot and killed in the line of duty, there's a 999 call goes out over the radio, and then that means all the police go there because of the fact that it's a, you know, brother, brotherhood in arms sort of thing. You know, everyone wants to catch a, a cop killer sort of thing. No one wants to leave the, the police there, a, a brother police officer in a situation where they've been killed and, you know, not come to help them. So, of course, they go out and look at are they going to do this alternately at the same time you have the side of the police and some of these obviously cross over being that some of the the dirty police are in the gang and also doing their job as policemen you have in there um, a new uh, recruit coming in from another department played by Casey Affleck he is actually teamed up with one of the men from the team played by Anthony Mackie um, you have in there as well uh, Woody Harrelson plays a, a more senior a detective Aaron Paul plays one of the um, other criminals Norman Reedus plays one of the criminals uh, Gal Gadot is also in there in, uh, in a role that's connected through all of the um, the uh, the the Russian mob side of things. So you've got quite a, a sort of big cast in this thing, um, and it's it's a film that I mean anything like this uh, with the cops and the criminals thing and the two sides of it all is gonna get connect is, is gonna get referenced against things like Heat and compared to stuff like that. Michael Mann's film, which is kind of become the example of how to do this, it doesn't manage to match the heights of Heat. Um, which is not to say that it's a bad film because it's not it's actually a good film it's a good solid thriller it is a little bit on the long side it feels very long when you're watching it because it is um, not quite two hours long but it feels longer than that because there are some sequences where it's trying to stretch out the tension and it's unfortunately at these scenes that let it down because it feels like it's unnecessarily trying to stretch out the tension if it had been maybe a bit faster paced if those scenes had been a bit more streamlined it would have maybe been uh, made for a better experience but the thing that's interesting about it is that it does have for all of these characters there is character development for all of them which is the rare thing to have for having what are we uh, 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 nine ten characters that was going to be my, one of my questions I was going to ask you at the end of, uh, at the end of your review because normally it is when you've got a big ensemble cast, yeah, you can sort of like a couple of the characters can get lost. So by the sounds of what you're seeing, um, that's not the case with this one. No, because there is elements to all of the characters. They all have something. With them. Even there is uh, the one of the weaker elements, especially given the the focus on more of the criminals. But then this this kind of this one good cop in amongst it all, which is the uh, Casey Affleck's character. You have him with his uh, wife, played by Teresa Palmer. Um, and this weird thing of the, the scenes with them which it, it almost at times feels like the whole thing of setting up the you know the whole thing of the oh you know don't you know do your job don't do your job and come home your job is to come home your job is not to catch the bad guys your job is to go away and then come back at the end of the day and be home sort of thing and it's that kind of you know almost pointing the finger of saying oh you know he's going to be the one and that sort of thing and it it kind of has those red herring elements in there as well which is good but those scenes to be honest could have been completely excised from the film Teresa Palmer's role could have you know she's not having a good year with Point Break and this but she could have been completely excised from the film her her role is probably the most superfluous one to it um, but it's it's a good thriller all round and as I say I did get engaged with it by the end of it I was I don't want to say upset or anything because obviously people get through it people don't but by the end of the film I walked out of it and I was like I actually had I actually had had a feeling for about the characters and about the film which is a good thing because you walk out of this kind of thing and often it's yeah well you know doesn't matter whereas you said you know you walk out and you go well you know that was a shame that character you know and you actually start to care yeah um, it looks uh, th- th- I think the trailer is slightly deceptive 
because the way the trailer plays out, it looks like a by the numbers kind of thing. It, it just didn't well, seem to be very much in the trailer that made me interested in the in the movie. I I think I seen the trailer twice, um, once uh, watching it on YouTube, and uh, the second time was I can't remember what film it was attached to, but it just felt like one of those movies that was thrown out. Um, in the cinema on a week where there isn't very many big films out because mm. so they know that it, it's going to do okay numbers yeah i mean it's the thing about it. i mean it kind of does have that by the numbers thing but it then kind of bucks that a little bit by being you know you're more for the majority of it you're more focused on the criminal side than you are the police side so it isn't the whole thing of i mean because heat was more split kind of 50 50 and showed the deficits of both criminal life and police life this is more sort of towards the criminal life but then the police side does come into it obviously with characters that have a foot in both worlds sort of thing yeah and you, you sort of like need that yin yang don't you for the yeah. for a film like that to work because then it wouldn't be as interesting if you just seen it from the bad guy's point of view but then yeah. it wouldn't be interesting if you just seen it from the good guy's point of view exactly um, Born Tomahawk, then directed by S. Craig Zala and it's his directorial debut, he's an FX artist he's also worked on um advertisements and music videos and things like that it seems to be the sort like case as of late um directors uh, seem to be coming out of the woodworks that's worked on things like music videos in the past and so when they cut their teeth on a, a big film or their first feature film i always thought like go in a way to the indie side of things but in this case with uh with zala he's sort of, like gone indie but slightly big with the cast so you've got an impressive cast in kurt russell and Patrick Wilson and Matthew Fox and Richard Jenkins and David Arquette and the storyline is sort of like it, it's an interesting dichotomy of a film because it for predominantly I would say 80% of the running time it's your very bog standard revenge western kind of film so it's set in your very typical western town you've got a sheriff who's played by uh, Kurt Russell um, something bad happened when the wife of Patrick Wilson's character gets kidnapped there uh, one night. It's discovered that it could be the indigenous Indians who seem to live in the high mountains um, all the way out of the outskirts, not just from the town, but from pretty much everything else. So any kind of society on the outskirts of that. So it's up to Kurt Russell, along with uh, Matthew Fox's character, who seems to be sort of like the lecherous one, the one who you think might have a few secrets and another couple of people and including Patrick Wilson to try and hunt down and find out his wife but then things take a grisly turn now here's a clip that there's not very many clips out there that give you a feel of the film this is a clip it doesn't do the film any justice whatsoever but it just gives you the kind of character of what um, the sheriff is like Emily <laughs> <laughs> and you're making fry bread well, that's my intention but where'd you put the spoons? They're no place logical. I thought you might explain that enigma. That's you, Clarence? Excuse me. Door's open. Why are you in my breakfast? Here's a uh, situation. Serious. I'll leave you two. This morning I went out to tend to my colt, needed a new shoe. And when I got there, I saw Buford, the stable boy. He was laying there dead. He was all torn up. An animal got to him? I don't know. I couldn't say. I just, I didn't care to linger, you know. I just, I just went down to the office to try and get a, a deputy. But when I went inside, there was nobody in there. Nobody? Not even in the jail cell? No, sir. Completely empty. Go up the street, fetch Chickory, and meet me in front of the stable. Yes, sir. Now, even though a lot of places have actually been giving away something involving Bone Tomahawk, I think it's a spoiler to actually give it away because it's not indicated in the trailer. It's sort of like an indication of what these um, indigenous Indians are like. And I just don't want to give that away because the whole point of the film is to get up to that point and then for you to be hit in the face by it. And so when an impact like that is softened, you start to, because I got it uh, sort of like in a way spoiled for me or of what happens. And I felt like the last 20 minutes, even though a lot of critics have turned around and says it's really extreme and hard to watch, I found it very easy to watch. 
and so it just diluted it badly so I don't want to give any of that away and but like I said for the first 80 percent of the film it's a very typical slow paced western movie and we've we've sort of like had a resurgence of westerns over the last um, 12 months it has a lot in common with uh, slow west for example now the way that film plays out is a very lethargic pace but because of the fact that it's got some proper decent character development in it you don't mind the, the pace of the film being as slow as it is and that's exactly what this is it, it's the relationship between the four people who have gone out to try and look for Patrick Wilson's character's wife and it seems to be how they're managing to bond together to try and come up with how they're going to find her and what they're going to do when they do find her and you also are digging in, into the surface of their, their traits some some of them um, have got secrets dark secrets Matthew Fox's character especially you can definitely tell that from the second he walks onto the scene and his first scene that he does his character has got you, you know that there's, there's going to be treachery there somewhere or you know that he's going to do something or could he and so he's always a character who's got a question mark above his head and I liked that about the film it's just when the nastiness occurred I just felt like it was from a different movie and the film itself could have been it could have just run with its western side and it would have made a much more interesting movie and just made it very straightforward with the end 20 minutes but instead the director had an idea for a, a different kind of film and thought that idea that I have will not work as a full film because I don't have enough to actually flesh that out to make it a full film so why just I don't why just I just attach it to this one and put it on there and unfortunately it doesn't work it's worked for a lot of people but for me I just felt like it, it, it felt like two different types of films and it can work sometimes but you need that little bit to be interleaved throughout the story of the, of the slow part of it Ravenous for example if you watch that movie it is about cannibals but this start of like drip feed you with bits that it could be about cannibals and then you do get to the nastiness in the last 25 30 minutes of the film because some of the nastiness is drip fed to you throughout this move throughout the movie this one it doesn't do that with it and so when you do get hit by the impact at the end it feels like it's a diff you're watching a different film you're watching a short attached to um 80 percent of a movie acting wise very well done um kurt russell again i think he uh, he just he's at home when he's playing a western character and Matthew Fox is really good and he's got that vaudevillian kind of twirling his moustache kind of thing you're expecting him to pull out a big massive train track and tie somebody against it and so <laughs> they've, they've got that, the brilliant troops and that character it's just it's 80% of a very good film 20% of a bit of a disappointing movie Okay, uh, on to The Finest Hours, which is directed by Craig Gillespie, uh, who last directed Million Dollar Arm. Um, and that, as well as this, were both Disney films. Uh, this is actually a Disney film, um, which I didn't know until it actually started rolling. Um, it is based on a true story of events that happened in the 1950s, where um, two oil tankers um, actually were damaged during weather um, and broken um, in half, and actually ripped in half. Um, and um, the issue is that then during that situation, when one ship was damaged, um, that all of the, the sort of the fleet of the Coast Guard at the time, obviously the 1950s, weren't as advanced as they are today, but went out to you know help and try and rescue the men. Um, and then this other ship was hit and damaged and uh, left basically with uh, the forward section of the ship being completely ripped off and sinking the rear section of the ship where the engines are and where everything the generators and stuff are um, is still there still active and um, sealed off so it, it has kind of a, a moment of buoyancy before it will fill with too much water and then eventually sink uh, the, the issue then of the crew that are remaining sort of are um, amongst themselves sort of fighting this over with the, the sort of the chief engineer of the ship uh, played again with um, Casey Affleck um, in his second film of the week um, who is sort of the one there who has to kind of bolster the men and, and you know talk them around and convince them that the only way they can basically survive is to give themselves enough time by trying to essentially steer manually the what the remains of the ship and beach it in order to buy the coast guard time to get to them here's a clip that boat is too small for these seas and this ship 
will be sunk by nightfall. Every fella here wants to live. The only way that happens is if we run her aground. Now we're gonna set up a watch and look out for a shoal. I need four men working the police on the emergency tiller. I need four men manning the pumps aft to steering. The rest of you run a bucket line top side down below. Communicate with the engine room. And somebody keep blowing that whistle. You heard him, boys. So you have this sort of side of the story, but you also have another side of the story, which is of the uh, Coast Guard. Uh, characters which are led by a character Bernie played by Chris Pine um, we're actually introduced to Bernie very early on at the very beginning of the film um, sometime before this is happening uh, where he's actually meeting a girl that he likes and their romance and everything going on which leads to them being engaged and then the whole thing of Bernie then is going out against sort of really rough seas and in a ship that really isn't designed to handle those kind of conditions but being that most of the fleet is already out of this other ship he has to go out and try and find this ship and, and lead sort of a, a small four man crew out on a tiny ship which really is sort of you know the, the worst situation to be doing it um the thing with this film is it is very much a kind of an old style disney film as much as it's got loads of effects and it's all because you've got the cgi effects of the water which are genuinely impressive there's um the sequence when they're basically getting out of the the cove and going in the this small boat over big swells that to get out beyond sort of the um where the water kind of hits the shallows and it brings up these big massive waves and everything it's almost like a the ship is almost diving under the waves and coming back up and it's got some real great intensity to those scenes and they look really impressive they're, they're, at no point did i ever think in this film oh that's cg that's terrible cg or at no point will i put off by the effects they were very very good in it the problem is that the film has this old style thing of that it focuses a lot on the characters and it focuses to a degree that at the very beginning it actually is one of the slowest start in the films which is nice on occasion and it's nice to do some character setup it didn't need to be as really kind of uh, melodramatic as it is for the first half hour of the film with this happening because it's kind of the first half hour and it's a two hour film to, just under two hours running time film and the first half hour could have been stripped down very much so to make it a much more and I, I don't want to say just get into it but it really didn't need all that there is sufficient character in this to have it be you know about what's happening and stuff and, and going on and still be interested in the characters the problem is it takes just too long getting there for it uh, once it does get there and you have the situation on the ship which happens first and you focus on that for a while then it goes back and forth between the two and you do get a good sort of uh, sort of adrenaline building up there and an action building up there and momentum going but the problem is that it's uh, even at its best points in this film did I I never felt that exhilaration, that excitement, that danger that you got with, and this is the reason why I picked the clip at the very start of the show, with The Perfect Storm, the the film from the uh, late 90s, or was it early, to, early 2000s, um, with George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg, which I loved right up to the end because of things there, and I, and I don't want to say more than that about that because it will relate to this, and I don't want to do that, but I really have an issue with this that the film just it, it never reached the levels of tension and excitement that i thought oh god what's happening and, and it never it never got me to you know grip my armchair of my of my seat or anything which is a shame because it has that potential um it has that thing as well i mean at the end of the film when there is something happening and, and at the very very end it just it's like it doesn't know how to wind down it doesn't know how to go that's the story that's the end thank you good night it really doesn't know how to do that it just it's almost like it wants to kind of do lord of the rings thing and it doesn't know when to stop it anyway, wants to have so many endings that it wants to keep going and again trimming that would have made it for a much more 
better film and a much more thing. I mean, I know obviously it's based on true story and these things happen and such, but um, there and I, I suspect there probably is some creative license taken here and there, but there's nothing in it that makes you go, oh yeah, you know, there's nothing that makes you kind of go impressive, you know, oh yeah, yeah, go for it, you know, sort of thing, and that's a shame because it, it does have that potential, it just doesn't live up to it. It's not bad, but it just I came out of it just wanting more. It's set in the same area where the perfect storm happened as well, actually. It is, yeah. So, it is. Um, so it, it makes you question, why go out there? Just stop <laughs> doing that. Just stop going out there. Yeah, I mean, it's got... And the thing is, it has... It's a film that you don't have to have them, but the effects are there, and the effects actually do work. It's one of these films where the effects do... The effects do support a story. Just that the film doesn't know how to focus between the story and the effects it, it's at times it's very story heavy when it doesn't need to be and at times it has some great effect sequences when you kind of like going i want more story i want more character right on to the final uh, cinema release of the week and the throwaway kind of movie of the week um how dun, do we dun, dun. Uh, the kind of film that you would have expected to be released on valentine's day and some cinemas thought it was smarter to actually have preview days uh, on valentine's day for this kind of movie because it is a romantic did they actually do that comedy. yeah they, they, they did. actually did that yeah. and so it's a romantic comedy and there was not no romantic comedies released this year on valentine's day so this is the only movie in the sort of like area of Valentine's Day, so I thought, why not? Why don't we release a movie about being single? Smart idea. When in fact, a How to Be Single is not a movie about being single in a way. It's a movie that doesn't know what it wants to be. It's how to be single slash a couple slash maybe single, possibly in a relationship, possibly one night stand kind of thing. So when they were going to go with that title, but they thought it was a bit too long. Um, it's directed by Christian Ditter and it stars the court of Johnson and just sent us around her character. She's in a relationship. All of a sudden, the relationship breaks down. She gets a, a job working in a hospital. She moves in with her sister. She befriends a character played by Rebel Wilson, who plays Robin, who's sort of like there as a Yoda. She's there to mentor her on how to be single because uh, her character has not been single before. And so she, she's just telling her the lifestyle of what it's like being single. You can go out on a night out with your friends. You can have one night stands, hookups, that kind of thing. But throughout the film, including her sister who's played by Leslie Mann, they always want to be in a relationship. So it's not about them being single or how to be single. It's how to be sort of single but wanting to be in a relationship as well and have your cake and eat it too. Here's a clip. The new guy has sort of been checking you out. Which one? He's... Did you get it? No. All right. He's like, right over there. No. No. Why? Because he's too young. All young guys want to do is have sex all day. All I need is just a quick 10 minutes and then a really long nap. How old is that on the butt anyway? Like 27. The only reason a guy like that would ever talk to me is to get a prescription for medical marijuana. So, no. I think he's coming over. Yeah, no, he's totally going. Wait, he might be going to the food. Don't look over there. No, he's coming. He's here. Now, you said, is it is Jud Apatow involved in it? Yeah, because no, obviously not. the connection there being that Leslie Mann is married to Judd Apatow, hence, you know, this is 40 and things like that. No, he's not. Drew Barrymore is. She's a producer on it. But Judd Apatow has not got his dirty little fingerprints on it, and it feels exactly like a Judd Apatow movie. It's a movie that is confused with its own title. Even my description there, it shows you what kind of film that you that you're going to get. You're you're going to get people who are mourning about they want to be single, yet the second they are single, they're mourning about not being in a relationship. And so it's just a film about mourners who find it really funny about what they're doing. And then you throw in the Rebel Wilson character who feels like she's playing a more fleshed out character of a fat Amy one from Pitch Perfect. And so they've adulted up a little bit and that she's only in there for the comic relief because without Rebel Wilson, the rest of the movie would have been so flat. It's like getting a gorgeous souffle and then you stick your fork in it and it shrivels down to just nothingness. It's an unfunny, weird little created film because the fact that it, it just hasn't a clue what its identity is. 
and you, you need these kind of movies to know what they are firstly but you also need the humor to be there and the humor is not even present uh, Dakota Johnson is much better than this she was not bad in Fifty Shades of Grey as an actress because the character that she was given uh, especially written was horribly written and so she played it to the best she was able to do in this kind of movie it's like it is like throwing a really good actress into a car crash it's exactly like Robert De Niro throwing him into a car crash of a movie like Dirty Grandpa but he looked like he was enjoying what he was doing whereas she looked like she's just got trapped wind <laughs> and like she does not want to be there and I, I don't think anybody you heard the way Leslie Mann was speaking there she had just no emphasis in her voice at all and that's just indicative of how the film plays out nobody is interested in any of the, the characters that they're playing or what they're doing or why they're there and if that's the case then you know you're going to get a horrible movie and this is it's just exactly that it's a completely forgettable really badly created mess of a movie okay so dakota johnson is sort of potentially good because she, she was good in this she was good or she's goodness she was good in uh, the bigger splash um, then I mean, is it is it just that she's getting not good films or as lead, or do you think there is something to her sort of performance in films as well? Because I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey, she was good, she was okay in it, she wasn't great in it, but it, the film wasn't great. She's getting badly written characters. That's what she's getting. She might look at it on paper, and um, she might only get a basic synopsis of the character and think, actually, that's an interesting way to do a romantic comedy. Uh, let's do a comedy which set, a romantic comedy that centers around people who are being si- who are single who are trying to be single they're not in it for relationships one night stands fine but they're not in it for relationships and on paper it, 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 it fits her it also fits people like Leslie Mann and Rebel Wilson but when you actually dig more down into the characters that they've created for them then you in fact the alarm bell should have rung straight away so the, yeah it, it's it's terrible and it should be glad that that's the last of the cinema films we're, we are reviewing this week. We'll yeah. be back in a moment anyway with the Blu-ray and DVD <laughs> section of the show. There was a, a real sense of you were doing something wrong, but that did give it that, that feeling of excitement. When the reveal of the film happens, that's when it just becomes absurd. And the atmosphere and just the sense you get whenever you go into it is undeniable. It, it did absolutely zero for me, which could be for the hype. What we've just discussed there is just scratching the surface on it. Hi, I'm Eric England, the director of Contracted, and you're listening to From Page to Screen, the horror show. And so we're back with this week's DVD and Blu-ray release sections. In the home section, we have uh, coming up the UK DVD and Blu-ray Top 10, and then these new releases. James Bond returns Inspector, then you have comedy drama with a watch. You sound, sorry, you just sound so droll and uninterested in that. Pretty much every film that I am reviewing <laughs> on the DVD and Blu-ray section, I am very enthusiastic about it. Um, you have horror movie, big massive air quote time, with Green Inferno, then you have small drama with Free Held, the, one of the weirdest films I've seen this year, in comedy drama sort of with hints of horror, Nina Forever. And then to end things off, a thriller that was just chucked out of nowhere in dark places. Yep, um, but as, as I said before that, the DVD and Blu-ray top 10, starting at number 10 with Everest. Yeah, you know, see it on the biggest screen possible. If you've got a projector or something like that, that's a fantastic way to watch it. If there's a cinema that's having a, like, a special Wednesday or a special Tuesday where you get to see a film and have a cup of tea and a biscuit for like £3 or something like that, see it on there. And then if the, if your last sort of like port of call is your television screen, try to watch it on a bigger screen possible because it helps. And try to have a good sound system as well because it helps with the film. It's a good film, but it deserves to be on a bigger screen. Uh, number nine is Mage Runner The Scorch Trials. Parts of the movie are fine. The rest of the film is just by the numbers kind of stuff, which doesn't help you the first part of the series because the first part of the series laid a very good foundation. This sort of like... Just adds little bits on top of it. It's like playing a game of Minecraft, and all you've got to build items out of is wood. Uh, number eight. That's an interesting one. Um, and number eight is Sicario. Yeah, um, very good acting in the film. I think the cinematography outshines the acting, which um, it's an interesting thing to to do. Directed by Denis Villeneuve, a fantastic director. I, I've I've liked 
I wouldn't say all of his films in general, but I've liked parts of his worst of fil- worst worst of films. Worst. His worst films, which it, this I would say Sicario is one of his bad films, but it's not a bad film at all. So I've liked elements of them. I, and I just think he's a really smart, very and very intelligent director. And it, it's got Emily Blunt. She's fantastic in the movie, and so is Benicio del Toro. But he plays brooding down to a T. Yeah, interesting going from Prisoners to Sicario to Blade Runner 2. Uh, and so Pan is at number seven. Pan. We'll just leave it at that. It's not. I disagree. It's got a lot of problems, but it's not. I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as everyone makes it out to be. It, it was surprisingly entertaining when I saw it, and I was kind of thinking, well, everyone's being really harsh on it. It has its problems, but I didn't think it deserved a lot of the naysaying that it's had. Yeah, it, for me, it belongs very, very, um, right, like side by side to John Carter. Oh God, you're that's oh, oof. That's harsh, even for John Carter as well. That's off. Yeah, John Carter, though, it's, it's an awful film. No, it's not. It's not. Let's move on, though. Um, Inside Out is at number six. A yeah, brilliant animated movie. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, Crimson Peaks, new entry number five. I absolutely adored this film. I, I just absolutely loved it from acting point of view, down to cinematography, down to story, down to just music, down to just everything about this film. I, I loved it. I Did you love the 3D? I, I I don't want to see it in 3D because it'll <laughs> dilute what the film actually uh, shows and I just got swept away in everything to do with this movie not because of the fact that I, I'm a huge Del Toro fan which I am I'm a sort of like a little giddy school kid when it comes to Guillermo Del Toro but if a different director directed this and did exactly the same thing I'll be praising that director because I just absolutely love the gothicness of it and I, there's very few films that uh that embrace this kind of genre it's a hard genre to get right and I think Del Toro is one of the only directors who can do that uh, new en- sorry not new en- uh, number th- number four is Legend yeah um, a good uh, acting role there by Tom Hardy it's just the rest of the film just lacks good double role by Tom Hardy yeah Yeah. Um, and number three is Hotel Transylvania entertaining fun family kids animated film um, it, it, it's got a few funny jokes in it it falls really well it reminded me of the groovy ghoulies like I, I said this last week when we were reviewing uh, the sequel which we'll get onto in a moment but yeah it, it just reminded me of that and I love the groovy ghoulies it doesn't have the music numbers of the groovy ghoulies but it had that humour of it and it was fun it passed 90 minutes and we were fine Okay, um, and so The Martian dropping down from last week's number one is at number two. Yeah, Ridley Scott's best film in a very long time, down to write and down to acting as well. I know a lot of plaudits we've heaped upon Drew Goddard, but you also have to um, give definitely plaudits to Matt Damon, but they're a very hard character to play because when you've got a, a solidary character, solidarity character to play like he, him, uh, being uh, abandoned on a planet like Mars, it's going to be a really hard thing to do. And also when somebody can say the word potatoes with a straight face, it is just well done to him for bringing potatoes up to the forefront. I'm not going to be doing that, though. I'm not that desperate to eat potatoes. But, yeah, well done to him on that front. And so, yeah, it, it's Ridley Scott's best film in a very long time. Uh, okay, and so that means the new number one is Hotel Transylvania 2. Just... Yeah, this is a very lacking sequel. It's a sequel that just has none of the charm, has none of the wit, has none of the humour, has none of the the very well animated scenes. The va va <laughs> It's just it, it's not very well handled at all. It's a shame as well. Yeah, it is. It's just it's a lazy sequel. Um, so that's that's the top ten of the DVD and Blu-ray releases. So on to this week's releases. We have got our first big release. So take it away. Yeah, it's Spectre. It's the latest Bond film. There we go, review done. <laughs> I don't think I actually need to see very much about Spectre, considering that um, people saw it in their droves in the cinema, and you'll have made up your mind instantly if you were going to buy it on Blu-ray and DVD, so whatever I see it is not going to interest very many people, is it? Because they already knew what I thought about it when, when it was released in cinemas. But just in case, anyway, it follows, surprisingly, a character called James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, 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 that that's um, it's going to make you scratch your head, but really, it's James Bond. He's 
in Mexico City at the start of the film. It involves a huge mass of set piece. Again, a James Bond movie with that. Um, and just the way the film flows, it's very much exactly like a Bond movie. It's a waste of time me telling you the story and all that kind of stuff. Here's a clip giving you a feel of what it's like. Information is all. Is it not? For example, you must know by now that the double O program is officially dead. <laughs> Which leads me to speculate exactly why you came. So, James, why did you come? I came here to kill you. And I thought you came here to die. Well, it's all a matter of perspective. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more to it than that, really, though, isn't it? I know, but Christoph Waltz has actually pretty much explained the storyline straight just there after the incident that happens in Mexico City. Um, the Double O program is disbanded, but uh, obviously James Bond is sort of like he, he doesn't know that until he does come eye to eye with um, Waltz's character, and so that that's been disbanded. So you've got all that kind of stuff that's happening in London. All the while, it's up to Bond to try and stop Walter's character from doing what he's doing. I'm not going to explain what, what who he plays because that's giving away a bit of a spoiler, and I, I don't want to do that. But you've got a henchman who's played by uh, Dave Bautista who plays Hinks, and you've also got um, supporting James Bond in this one. You've got Leah Sadu's character who plays Madeline, and then he's got his little henchman Q, uh, Ben Wishaw, and Naomi Harris who plays Money Penny. Um, and crops up in the, in one of the scenes of the movie, very underused, is Monica Bellucci's character. And uh, yeah, it just I think I think uh, Waltz actually explained it in a very small little nutshell. The whole point of a Bond movie is the plots have never been overly complicated about the movie. It's never been about the overly complicated plots. It's all been about Bond's character and how he sort of like interacts with characters and how the film flows. And then it's it's boring. It's unfortunately boring. There will be a time when a Bond movie grabs hold of me and goes, you know what, this is what the series is exactly about. Um, this is what the character is, and it's going to flow with some decent set pieces. It's going to flow with some decent dialogue, etc. But this one, it just whimpers. It's like a, no offense to it, and it's, this might sound nasty, but it's like a dog that's dragging its hind legs, getting ready for somebody to pull a shotgun on its head and put it out of its misery. It's it's a it's a series that I think it is definitely about time that Daniel Craig steps away from Bond because it, it's a series that really does need a new reboot because he's brooding he's been brooding throughout the previous Bond films and I'm bored of it I got really bored of it in Skyfall but it took se a second view for that to occur um, in this one, Inspector, he mopes and meanders throughout the entirety of the movie. And I know a lot of people go, Oh, it's because of the incidents that happened in Skyfall, blah de blah de blah Yeah, so what? He doesn't have to do that through every single one of the Bond films that he's played it in. Um, we've had an, I've had enough of it. We, we need new blood. We need somebody else to play it. We need to go in a different direction, which reignites the series it, it's sort of like it's just me speaking anyway because i'm the one who's reviewing it it doesn't need re reigniting because of what the box office has done uh, of the movie but i think it's a series that is lacking and languishing now and something needs to be done about it um sam mendes i think he has now properly stepped away from the series and so he will not do a third one um it's about time some another director actually cast his eye over the Bond series and I think it probably is about time that Daniel Craig stepped away from the series there's it starts off quite well I think the Mexico sort of like set piece is okay here it's a bit too green screen heavy but I think it's 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 okay here it's fine and normally the opening set pieces of Bond movies are are actually quite entertaining there's the opening of Skyfall it was very well implemented the set piece of it and you think it yeah, this could be the time when the Bond movies um, has got back its its entertaining aspect of it, but also still added the dark, brooding elements that might be needed of it, that, that we are getting from, like, the Bond series or other film series. But it doesn't do that. It just wastes it away and throws it down the drain and starts just meandering through set piece after set piece and just doesn't get anywhere very slowly as well. I didn't like it surprisingly as much as i disagree with you 
largely on this I can see where you're coming from because I, I don't think it's a particularly great Bond film I think it is troublesome with the character I think that it is troublesome and I don't necessarily think that I want Daniel Craig to go yet because I do think he's been the best Bond actually I think he's been better than Sean Connery especially in Casino Royale which is a, a favourite of mine um, and Skyfall I liked as well but I, I didn't like this as much because it just felt very much going through the motions I didn't think that Daniel Craig was particularly interested in the, in the character um, which I don't think means he stepped away but I think it's him and Sam Mendes working together on a film a second time didn't work I think maybe they worked the first time fine enough with Skyfall but then the collaboration here, whatever it is, has, has fallen apart and hasn't worked. I, I think that it is a film which is riddled with problems of story. Um, I think that it is a problem that is, a film is riddled with problems of action because even some of the action sequences aren't especially well done. As much as there's a nice fight on a train that happens, which is a kind of nice throwback to the old Bond films, there's other sequences in it as well which are really just quite uninteresting as an action set piece in particular a scene with a plane chase which is just it, it honestly just i i thought i wondered what was going on because it just felt like a mess in that sequence and i i thought a lot of the story and the character bits to do with um christoph holt's character really just didn't work i thought it was very unnecessary and very much kind of peddling to the audience that it didn't need to do so it, it's not a great Bond film, I don't think it's a terrible Bond film, I think there are definitely worse ones out there but it's definitely not amongst my favourites with um, Daniel Craig, I mean it's it's better than Quantum of Solace but only because it's it's Quantum of Solace was a complete and utter mess but this just it's my, other than Quantum of Solace my least favourite Daniel Craig Bond film I just didn't like it full stop I got on more with Skyfall than I did with this one so that, that, that says a lot, it, it's just I've never been a fan of the series, to be honest. I just I don't get why people enjoy Bond films. It's up to you what kind of films you like, but I just don't get why people enjoy Bond mm. films. I have found previous Bond films in the past, the cheesy humour might work, or the cheesiness work, but it just, predominantly for me, it's just never been a series that's actually attracted me, and I reluctantly go to see the next one in the series, and... I don't want to do that as a movie fan. I don't. I want to actually be walk out the cinema and go. You know what? That that's actually changed my mind a little bit. It's obviously, it's not going to take one movie to do that, but a one movie will help me uh, push me into the right direction. It might actually change my mind. And this is definitely not going to do that. Spectre will not change any Bond naysayers' minds. It will never make them go. You know what? This was fine. It, it just will not do that. Okay, on to the next film, which is A Walk in the Woods, uh, which is directed by Ken Quapis, or Quapes, I don't know how it's pronounced, but um, it stars Robert Redford as uh, Bill Bryson, the main character, who is a uh, novelist about uh, travel guides and travel stories. Um, he is sort of living retired in the US after having lived in the UK and all other places. He's finding himself a bit despondent with things. Um, he's perfectly happy at his, his home with his wife, uh, played by Emma Thompson in a small role, um, and his, his family sort of around a bit. But he's just he's feeling very despondent about things related to his work. So he decides what he's going to do when he ultimately sees it is come up with the idea of walking the Appalachian Trail, the so many thousand mile thing that's been used and referenced in referencing in most recently as well in, in uh, Wild with Reese Witherspoon. Um, here you have him though looking at this and of course then decides he's going to do it his wife says well you shouldn't do it alone so he decides okay he'll phone around and tries to contact all the people he can that he knows over the years uh, most of which are either sort of passed on or um, not in contact or not willing um, until he ends up contacting Stephen an old friend played by Nick Nolte here's a clip hey Stephen Jason. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Steve uh, this is uh, my wife. You're the British nurse I've heard so much about. I mm -hmm. certainly hope so. Yeah. Oh. Me too. <laughs> That's a little bit like a bear hug. <laughs> Are you limping? No, oh, it's a titanium me. This one's a trick me, you know. It's a, oh. I'm always saying I gotta get that. I get this. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, 
I gotta eat every hour or so. Otherwise, I get these, uh... What, episodes? No, no, they're... they're seizures? I, seizures, that's right. You get seizures? Mm-hmm, yeah. You know, I ate some uh, contaminated penis IMEs about 10 years ago. You know, totally jacked up my system, you know. I thought you said you were in shape. I am. You know, when Nick Nolde speaks in the movie, it's the subtitles. Because I know in films like Train Spot and that, it'd be subtitles for the for American viewers because I couldn't understand the Scottish accent. I could, I could just barely understand what he was saying there. No, there's not. Um, there is, it is a a bit of an issue with the film because it does sound. It's almost like you, you, you know you can imagine him having a having a talk off with uh, Jeff Bridges from you know oh. True Grit or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that will just be a, just a nightmare. And you all read Bobcat Goldthwait alongside the uh, playing Z from the Police <laughs> Academy movies. Those three having an argument. Oh, oh yeah, that would be a, a bit of a ear scratcher, wouldn't it? Um, but yeah, this is um, though the whole thing of the two of them on the trail, and then you know one thing leads to another. They're arguing, they're friends, they're arguing, they're friends. There's you know a moment where they run into a bear, and these sort of things happen. But it's them talking about things and all, and it's a perfectly fine movie there's nothing brilliant about it it's it's not as well a film that really requires a great performance from either of them because they're just out walking on in the wilderness and, and that happening and there's some moments in it where they meet other other uh, hikers and some of them are interesting some of them are in particular one of them a woman they meet is really annoying um and it's a perfectly fine film it doesn't stretch out its time too long because it's less than two hours it's it's an okay one. I mean, it doesn't, as I say, need anything great from them. So they, they are just kind of giving performances as they go, and there's nothing wrong with it. It has some chuckles along the way. It has a couple of moments where you, it's it's nicely shot. It's nicely filmed, but that's it. It's just okay. Simple as that. Yep. It's just, okay. it's, just it's nothing. I mean, it's uh, it sounds like I'm saying you know, oh, it's just average. But it's not that it's just oh, it's just average. It's just that it, it does what it needs to. It does what it says on the tin. You know, it doesn't excel at it. Like some kind of varnish. Yeah. Okay then, fine. And that was my pen just falling down on the floor. Break the silence brilliantly. Green Inferno Northern. Directed by Eli Roth. <sighs> He's a director who I've had fantastic times watching these films from. I, I personally think that Eli Roth is one of the most arrogant directors out there. Um, he uh, he always brings up his movies and never fulfills his uh, what he's exactly creating. Uh, the film itself was thrown into cinemas, selected cinemas last week, and as we reported in the box office top ten, uh, there was no indication of how many screens it was shown at. Um, I, I'm sure I read somewhere it was only about four or five screens, but uh, there was no indication of how much money it took. And so evidently, it's getting thrown out on uh, Blu-ray and DVD. You know, the film went through development hell nobody would touch it nobody would actually um, release it when a studio did actually finally pick it up they dropped it straight away and so it was up to Bloomhouse Productions under their new Bloomhouse Tilt uh, banner so Jason Bloom stepped in they released a video together both, both him and Roth saying that the film was finally kept coming out it was released unfortunately on my birthday September the 25th in America so we've gotten it now and it shows it actually proves you um, why it's taken so long it pretty much is in a way a lifelike remake of cannibal holocaust however in this time it centers around a group of activists who goes out in the middle of the rainforest to try and stop um these trees from being bulldozed down however uh, when their plane um gets some kind of malfunction and it crashes in the middle of the forest they get kidnapped by this uh, amazonic tribe and then tortured and pretty much used as food for them and so it's up to um, how many actually survives from it to try and get out of there and the film itself it just is boring it, it's not it's not shocking considering that there are eye gouging scenes and there, there are scenes like that where people's flesh is being cut off or um, one of the, the guys who was one of the survivors of the plane crash um, he gets um, pretty much ripped apart while he's still alive and so instead of being like given a, some kind of sedative or any kind of thing that will knock him out he first gets his arm chopped off and then a leg chopped off and then his arm chopped off and then a leg chopped off his eyeballs gouged out and then his body is actually put into this sort of like kiln kind of fire and roasted like a pig lovely so you would think 
that, that sounds graphic and nasty, but mm. you're watching it and because the way the film's actually handled it looks more comical. It's the kind, when you watch like one of these comedy horror films, like a comedy zombie movie, when somebody gets their arm ripped off by a zombie, it seems more laughable rather than scary or gross out. And that's exactly how this film plays out. And it's not a comedy. It's just the way it actually plays out. It feels like it at the time that you want to laugh, but you shouldn't because you're not supposed to. Um, Acting-wise, it's badly uh, done. Um, the way the camera flows around is just supposed... It should be another character because you're supposed to be the camera, so you're supposed to be there, and you never ever feel like that. And it's just Eli Roth going, Oh, look at me. I'm doing a remake of uh, Cannibal Holocaust, blah de blah de blah I'm on screen, by the way. I'm in that scene there. And, oh, look, there's some gore for you. And, in fact, you just want to tell him to shut up and stop directing. Because he's just arrogance, and it's arrogance in cannibal form. Void it. Just go and watch Cannibal Holocaust for it. It's shockingness. Because what it actually portrays in that movie is much more shocking. And that movie came out in the mid-70s. This is a film that came out in 2015 slash 2016. It's just bad. It's really bad. Okay, um, on to then uh, Dark Places, which is uh, directed by... Uh, uh, and it's, it's, I'm not sure if it's Giles or Gillies, because it's, 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 so it's got two L's. It's around, are you? Well, it's, it's got two L's, so I don't you know... But... Dark Places instead of three um, held first. Oh, sorry, yes. My mistake, yeah. Do you but, choose whichever uh, one yeah. you want to do. Yeah, yeah sorry. But, um, yeah, Dark Places um, is directed by, I'm going to say Gillies... Paki Brenner, um, but the interesting thing is it's written by, based on a novel written by Gillian Flynn, which um, I believe um, I was told earlier is, is actually the the same person. I'm not checked into this, but is the the writer of Gone Girl. Yeah, I, I read that somewhere yeah. as well. Um, uh, so of course this is a, a film that sort of possibly has simulations that it doesn't know. It's very very similar. I'm just going to say that it's interesting that she's written this, but it is not like Gone Girl. What it is, though, is a drama centering around the character of Libby Day, played by Charlize Theron, who is sort of having issues with her past. She's broke, pretty much. Um, she is not really able to work. She, she finds herself, you know, having no real sort of work history or anything to support herself. Normally, she's been dependent on the donations of people because of the fact of that when she was eight years old, her entire family, her mother and her three sisters, uh, were all killed, uh, supposedly, by her brother, um, who is now in prison, uh, played by Corey Stoll. Um, this is a, a sort of a big issue with her um, and finds herself sort of receiving a letter asking her to come and meet with a character who wants to basically introduce her to the Kill Club. Uh, a group of people and, and sort of amateur sleuths and detectives that are looking to investigate things and in particular have kind of stumbled upon the events of her family's murder. Here's a clip. I mean, it's a, it's a real tragedy what happened. And your brother in jail going on 28 years. Look. If you and your little club want to convince me that Ben's innocent, you're wasting your no, time. No, just come along. It's like a, like a convention. How much? Five hundred dollars. And there'll be a lot of collectors there, so bring any souvenirs from your childhood. You I want a thousand. I can give you seven hundred, and you let us pick your brain about what happened that day. Fine. So, of course, she ends up sort of reluctantly going along to this and starts sort of getting involved with things and actually starts investigating things trying to work out exactly what happened and trying to figure out as well from memory and things what did actually happen what were the events that led to her whole family being killed um, and you see it cuts back and forth between present day and flashback to the time around that happening um, you have an interesting collection of cast there you heard in that clip Nicholas Holt is there as, as well as the person who also sort of brings her into the investigating side of things Christina Hendricks plays her mother when uh, in the flashback sequences Ty Sheridan plays her brother in the flashback sequences Ty Sheridan is uh, the, the boy if you don't recognize his name from things like Mud who was a big sort of standout from that and Joe um, and also in the, the flashback sequence as well um, is a, a performance from Chloe Grace Moretz so quite a well known sort of familiar group of uh, faces and actors um, and 
the thing with it is it's a film that is almost two hours in length and it never really gets going until kind of the last half hour 25 minutes and it really just stretches out things there's times when you're sitting there and you kind of you start getting interested in the, in the whole thing of the the investigation of it and it just never does anything with it for a whole section of the film and it never does anything with the characters for time it, it, it's this whole thing we were saying about like triple nine in the cinema section had so many characters and a lot of that is basically there's so many things going on and throwing it at the screen and seeing what happened and you kind of then got something from each one there's whole sequences in this where it's just characters there and they're talking but it's just it's honestly just and i don't mean this as a bad performance from the actors but they're just standing talking their lines it just doesn't feel like there's anything to it um but then in the last half hour it really starts to build tension things going on you start seeing things in flashback you start getting an idea of what happened you see the events that happen and and it's just it's a real shame the kind of the first half of the film just honestly feels like it doesn't exist it, you you kind of sat there nothing happening it, it doesn't really build on anything and you just wonder up until a certain point where it's going but once it does get going it actually becomes a bit interesting and it's a quite enjoyable thriller and suitable ending it's just that first hour before that really lets it down does it feel like a different director um it's held the last little part of the film compared to the first I would say by the sense of it, two thirds. It, it feels more like it's. Um, it, it's not that it doesn't feel like a different director. It feels as if it, the it decision was made. Like no, 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 it doesn't. But it feels as if it basically went. Um, oh, there's this happening, but we don't want to show you that yet. And all we, do, you know, and it's, as if it was trying to go all oh, teased, all oh, teased, you know, all teased. And then, and then there's like, oh, now you get all the stuff. Now you get it. And it just felt like it was just holding it all back. And then you just get flooded with it. And. It's just almost as if it couldn't it couldn't balance the two halves. Spends too much time teasing you rather than actually yeah. pointing your stuff. Actually, yeah, exactly. It's like if somebody walked up to you with a bag of chocolate and you go, ooh, 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 and then you just want to punch them in the face and take the chocolate off them. It's not like want to punch the director in the face and say, just get on with it. You're a violent person, aren't you, really? Tonight I am. I'm in one of those kind of moods. It's a good job I didn't have an absolutely horrendous kind of film than our Adam Sandler movie because then I would just... I think we might have actually put an explicit sticker on the show if that was the case. <laughs> um, I'm going to round my reviews off anyway with a weird film called Nina Forever. Um, it's a, one of those indie darling movies. I hate those kind of films. Those ones where um, you get these snobbery kind of critics or these snobbery uptight people going, Oh, you can't criticise this movie because it's trying something different. You just want to tell them to shut up, because it, it's a film. It's, it's supposed to be there to either interest you or entertain you. And in this case, it's directed by first-time directors Ben and Chris Blaine. And it's a three-piece kind of movie. It centers on three characters. Abigail uh, Hardingham, who plays Holly. Uh, Kean Barry, who plays Rob. And the title of the film, Fiona Sha uh, Shaughnessy, who plays Nina. Now, the film itself is... At the start of the film, Nina is involved in a car crash and dies. It's not a spoiler, it's in the trailer. And um, Rob is sort of like coming to terms with it, and he's trying his best to get over Nina. He meets up with the character Holly um, at work, and so they start to establish a friendship, ultimately leading on to a relationship. The slight little problem is, every single time that both um, Holly and Rob try to consummate their relationship, trying to put it as nice as I possibly can Nina turns up she manifests herself from the bed and she's unable to properly move because she is dead and so she's there to be part of um, Rob's conscious because because he can't seem to let go of her he can't seem to move on uh, point in case is the fact that Rob still visits um, Nina's family and so they're the family sort of like a saying to Rob please don't go away from us because you're the last thing that we've got that's attached to Nina. And he doesn't want to move on from her. And so obviously Nina is cropping up every single time that both um, Holly and Rob want to get together. And whether it be in bed, in, in, the, in Rob's flat, or in a very weird scene which involves both Holly and Rob after an argument on a bus having sex on Nina's grave. In a graveyard, she pops up there and so... 
it's a weird film. It's a very weird, very, <laughs> very well acted by the three people involved, and it needs to be. It needs to be very well acted because if it isn't, then it, it is just one of those annoying films. But it just really does make your head scratch about how did the directors come up with the idea in the first <laughs> place? It's it's a very weird, weird way of creating a, a love triangle movie. Very different way. It's not so much a horror movie because there is blood in it, but it's not one of those ones where you see people getting slaughtered and stuff like that. The blood is only present from Nina when you, when she does actually come out from the bed. So it's not that. It's more of a relationship movie and more of a, a romantic drama, but with that kind of interesting twist to it. So overall, acting-wise, it's very well done. The idea is an interesting one. It never fully fulfills the idea that it's creating, but it, it is unfortunately a one watch movie because you can watch it once but I think that's pretty much all you're going to get out of it you're not going to get any depth out of it after watching it the second time and by the time you've finished watching it you're not going to say to yourself you know why I actually I wouldn't mind watching that again it never actually spurs you on to see it a second or third time it just it's a one watch movie that one watch is good but after that, I, th I think you will actually see the flaws, major flaws in the film itself. So just watch it once and that's it. So rent it or watch it on a, an on-demand service rather than go out and buy it. Okay, the last film of the evening is Free Held, which is a drama based on the true story of uh, Laurel Hester, played in the film by Julianne Moore. Um, it's uh, all about the, this uh, policewoman who was um, uh, gay and was she was in a relationship with a woman played in the film by Ellen Page. Um, now we actually, as we start the film, we actually start introduced to them separately and they meet and there is a romance that sort of builds up to the, the whole thing as well. Um, Laurel is actually a police officer in uh, the, the New Jersey police. Um, she is sort of looking at things and, and everything seems fine with their relationship. They move into a house, they buy a house together. Um, the only problem is that then um, unfortunately Laurel is diagnosed with terminal cancer because of this she realizes the whole thing of the, the the two of them having been in a relationship and actually having been in a um the whole legal um uh, the i forget the name of it the, not the marriage but the partnership thing there is you know um the for for gay and lesbian couples um, the civil partnership, yes, that's the thing. They, they, them having been in that and having been wrecked in that, um, she then is the, the issue that obviously she's worried about her um, after she passes away and what will happen to her, uh, realizing that she's going to need support and such uh, financially. Um, and the issue is then that she starts looking into the whole thing of that because if you uh, if she was a policewoman and she was married to someone, that that other person would then get her pension after her death. Um, unfortunately the way the law is at the time um, this means then that this, this the pension would not go to Ellen Page's character and so she decides to sort of take this up and, and try and chase this um, with the the local uh, sort of government who are particularly sort of opposed to this here's a clip my name is detective Laurel Hester I've worked for the Ocean County Police Department for 23 years I'm here today with my partner Stacey Andre, in my career, I've never been afraid of injury or death while performing my duties. That's the job, and I love my job. Recently, I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. It's possible I finally met an opponent I can't beat. Please reconsider your decision and grant my request to assign my pension benefits to Stacey when I'm gone. When my heterosexual colleagues die, their pensions go to their spouses. But because my partner is a woman, I don't get to do that. In my 23 years as a police officer, I've never asked for special treatment. I'm only asking for equality. So you have in amongst all this, um, in the cast as well, you have Michael Shannon, who plays her partner in the police force. Um, and the whole thing of him then learning, because she's keeping she's been keeping her relationship status secret to avoid having to deal with issues in the police department as a as a gay woman in the police department she says that you know um, a woman d in this situation wouldn't be wouldn't get any promotion she'd be stuck in the back office and that would be it um and she's then sort of fighting for this um and 
ending up sort of not really willing to push it as much but then also comes into the film in a smaller role is Steve Carell playing a, a sort of a, a gay rights activist who is pushing for this to happen and, and all this to sort of come about too um, it, it's a weird kind of way that the characters inter, are into sort of connected that way but if you can get past that it's actually an okay film the thing that is stand out is Julianne Moore she is absolutely fantastic in the film as ever um, she really is sort of carrying the film because it's, it's not that it's a, a bad film it's just kind of one of these almost sort of TV movie things uh, it's directed by Peter Sollett so it's uh, he's I, I, I don't know what he's like before but he, he's done an okay job here but there's just nothing that makes it sort of cinematic and I, and I believe the film was released in a small cinema release this week as well but this is it's obviously been on I think demand, video demand as well and also then obviously DVD and Blu-ray and it it's more suited to DVD and Blu-ray or you know on demand on a smaller screen because that's where it, it kind of you get the most out of it on a big screen there is a there is a, an obvious disappointment with Ellen Page's in it and she's perfectly fine in the film but there's nothing particularly great about her performance in it the, I wanted more from her performance Michael Shannon it's perfectly fine, as I say. It's perfectly fine roles and, and perfectly fine performance, but it's it's not the exceptional Michael Shannon that we've seen recently in films. Uh, and Steve Carell, I mean, if we've seen in we said about we keep saying about the Big Short, he's absolutely brilliant there. He is not comically funny in this film. He's not doing a, a comedy. He's actually doing a good sort of dramatic, if over the top kind of preacher character. Um, but it's never done for comic kicks never done for comedy laughs is actually a, a dramatic role but it's it's not a great dramatic role it's not a great performance from it it's just an okay one so it kind of it's a film that ticks all the boxes and does fine except for Julianne Moore who is way above everyone else and, and in stature and performance in the film and I enjoyed it I was okay with it I didn't love it I didn't come out, I didn't think of it at the end of it going you know oh great I, you know I want to see that again it's again like you said a one watch film and that's it perfectly fine past the time good enjoyable um hour and 40 minutes film and that's it it was fine it's a, a, a nice thing about you know obviously one of these based on true events things and again just there's nothing exceptional about the story i mean obviously it's about gay rights and activists and things that happened in the past and there's an element to that but it just it doesn't do anything about that that makes it particularly exceptional that it really i feel should be under better hands it would have been a, a, yeah. a better film that you would have probably expect. it would have probably been a film that would not have been thrown out into cinemas and released on DVD and on demand at the same time considering the cast that, that, that you've got there it's the kind of film you would expect to have a proper proper release it's the kind of thing that would given the cast there and if there had been more for them in the roles not I don't mean more from the acting because the acting we know they can do the acting they just I think it was a very averagely written an averagely directed film if there had been more there there's elements there that could have possibly had it being a contender for oscar things you know it's it's yeah. that sort of a thing but it just it's very much kind of the tv version of it so that's it for this week's show uh, we're round up in a moment of things and go through things like our tv movie of the week but first of all sorry um our movie of the week but tv movies of the week i have five I have five as well. And any better we've got copies. Yeah. Um, as usual, you well, go you go, no, you go first. No, I'll let you. No, okay. All right. And, um, Tuesday the 23rd at 10.45 on Film 4 is the classic Train Spotting, which okay. is just one of the, the best sort of films of Danny Boyle's career and a great film and a great if you go back as well and looking at now the number of faces you'll go in there go wow I didn't realise they were in it and stuff you know it's one of those kind of things um, but it is a film that kind of launched several careers uh, other than the obvious ones like Ewan McGregor um, uh, Wednesday now this is a weird one Wednesday the 24th at 2.50am so that's Wednesday night Thursday morning on Channel 4 is the original Earthquake from 1974 starring Charlton Heston and that is it's an odd time I don't know why they've got it on then um, it feels maybe like they're filling it in or something but that's apparently on then which is an odd one um, Saturday 27th I expect you've got this one 9 o'clock on film 4 yep yep no. is it nope yep. Sat yep I have yeah yeah the impossible 
Yes. Which is just a phenomenal film, we've said before, and really quite a gut-punching film as well. Yeah. Um, about the the tsunami in uh, 2004? No. Yeah, I think it's yeah. right about that time, yeah. Um, and Sunday the 28th. Now, a double bill on Sunday the 28th on Channel 4, starting at 9 o'clock with The Wolverine, which is an okay film. It's not a bad one, but it's actually quite an enjoyable one, I think, for given all the comic book films of age now. And all. But after that, at 11.35, is Attack the Block, which is notable for Joe Cornish, who does a good job with it, as much as he may not have done a great job with Pan, um, but then also notable for having John Boyega in it, who has gone on to do great things in Star Wars: The Force Awakens. Yeah, and Joe Cornish didn't do Pan. Is it not Joe Cornish did Pan? No. I um, thought it was. Joe Wright did Pan. Oh, Joe Wright. Okay, that's my mistake then. <laughs> yeah, Joe Cornish went on. Um, he was. He. I know he wrote part of the Tintin movie. Yeah, he didn't direct it. Yeah, he did a few films, but yeah, it was Joe Wright who worked on the Harry okay. Potter films. That's my so mistake then. Yeah, um, my sele- so which one out of that lot would you choose? Uh, from all of them, um, it would be uh, it's a kind of a toss up between Train Spotting and The Impossible. And so I toss that coin, and you get Train Possible. No. Yeah. Because that would be a really depressing double bill. That. In Imp Spotting. No, it doesn't work no. either. No. Um, that sounds like a, a sequel to Troll Hunter. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's what is you know six and a half thousand. Which one you watch? You, if you want a really sort of dark, grim, grimy drama about drugs, then Trains One. If you want a dark, grimy <laughs> drama <laughs> about yeah, no, if you want a, if you want a dark, grimy drama about a natural disaster, then watch The Impossible. <laughs> If you want, and, and anyway, it's it's another disaster thing. Obviously, the earthquake. I should have sort of connected those two, but I didn't. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you off this week, then, but only this week. Mm. Um, I um to add to that list, I had the impossible also, which again reiterates it's on film phone Saturday the twenty seventh at nine o'clock. But um, as a double bill on BBC Two, on Friday night from nine o'clock, you have Filmina, which I I, I still haven't seen yet as well. It's a very good film very very good film I uh, should definitely give it a watch and then um, at 11.35 on BBC Two so it's not technically a double bill in a way because there's a little bit of a gap you've got The Disappearance of Alice Creed which is yeah. a very good film yeah, yeah but a very good. very hard watch brutal and quite sort of not violent but shockingly so yeah sort of. there's a couple of very very shocking scenes in that and pretty much set in one area Mm. So it is very well acted. Um, and they're both on BBC Two from Friday the 26th from 9 o'clock onwards. And the experience of Alice Creed is on at 11.35. Then on uh, the the two films I've got are on Saturday. So at Saturday, um, half past four in the afternoon, on Movie Mix, is That Thing You Do. I, 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 I mm. don't know why I have a soft spot for that film. Mm. I have a little soft spot for it. It's been a while since I've seen it. I'm um, not the I biggest really, fan of that. You really enjoyed that thing you do. I was not. I was not a big fan of that. I was kind of. I, but maybe just, again, the whole thing of the music is not my kind of music. So that may be why. I grew up on '60s music, but it's still not my kind of music. But I just like Tom Hanks's direction in that film. Mm-hmm. I thought it was very well actually done. And uh, my other choice is on film four on Saturday, Saturday the 27th at ten past eleven. The Craft. Uh, I, I really like The Craft. It's a very underrated little horror film. Uh, Feruza Bulk um, it, she's really creepy and very nasty in that movie but it's a very well created it's not like it is in a weird it, it, it's a teen movie but it's a teen movie that's got hushpa that's got testicles on it because it's not afraid to actually push the boundary slightly so instead of it being about four girls who mourn um, uh, about lives with boys and stuff like that it's four outcasts who try to do something about it in a dark, dark way. It's a film that's going to make you feel old, whatever it is, because it isn't it about 25 years old now? Six, I think. It 96, came out 20 years. Like 20 years, wow. Yeah, so I definitely recommend The Craft. But if I try to choose one out of that lot there, and you've, if you've not seen it, Philomena. I, even though I do really like that thing you do, and I think um, the four that I chose there are very strong films, in my opinion, I think Philomena is definitely, definitely worth a watch. It is one of the the best British films for the last few years. So that's on BBC Two on Friday at nine o'clock. No ads neither. Yeah, true. 
Okay, that's it for this week's show. Thank you for joining us and, and listening to us however you have. Um, if you are wondering where you can reach us other times, you can find us on our website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk. You can find us on Twitter. Stuart's on there at Critic Tadpole. I'm on there at AHDVD. And the show is on there at Monday Movie Show. Um, and you can find us on Facebook as well at facebook.com forward slash Monday Movie Show. Um, also as well check out you have um, our other show which Stuart does um, which is following the gamer which is through the same feed so you can find the links to that on the speaker website Saturday is the next one yep. um, and also check out uh, the websites that we're sort of connected with which is following the nerd.com and from page two the number two screen.com so um, that's it for this week we are going to play you out with a clip in a moment uh, of an upcoming film before that movie of the week reluctantly born tomahawk because i really like 80 percent of the film which is much more than any of the other films i've reviewed this week i'm gonna say actually as again kind of like that i understand that kind of reluctantly triple nine because i did enjoy it i did like it but i'm kind of torn between that on if you like cinema then obviously it's a big cinematic thing but surprisingly I would say maybe check out Free Held because it's a great performance from Julianne Moore if you want to see something at home then any bets a lot of people might have before the start of the show expected us to see a spectre but not no. the case nope so as I said that's it for this week we are going to leave you with a clip now of the upcoming Coen Brothers film Hail Caesar which comes out in a couple of weeks and has an incredible cast including George Clooney Ralph Fiennes Scarlett Johansson and Channing Tatum among others um, and looks to be sort of the Coen Brothers back on top humorous BC form in kind of form yeah um, we'll leave you out with a clip of that and we'll see you again next week until then bye 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 say your line exactly as I'm about to just as I'm about to do. Sure, okay. Would that it were so simple? 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 My dear boy, why do you say that? Why do you say it were? Well, you should say it like I said. Yes. Would that it were so simple? Would that it were so simple? Would that it were so simple? Would that it would that it were so no, no, simple? Watch, watch my mouth. Would that it were so simple? Would that it were so simple? Keep your head still. Would that it were so simple? Would that it were so simple? Would that it were so simple? W- w- I, I'm trying to say that, Mr. Lawrence. Lawrence? Hmm? I thought a minute ago it was L- Lawrence. No, we can use Christian names, my good dear boy. Lawrence is fine, just as I call you Herbie. Okay. So, would that it were so simple? Would that it was so simple? Would that it was so simple? Trippingly. Would that it were so simple? Trippingly. No, don't say trippingly. Say the line trippingly.